relative to the book, and I don't know that I had all these questions all along, um, but kind of bigger and more human questions that I think um, we ask as historians that aren't just relative to maybe that historic time period, but that are rise above those time periods is, how do we care for each other? And how and why do our ideas about our responsibilities to others <coughs> change over time? And who are we responsible for as families, as a community, as a nation? And of course, in this moment between 1820 and 1827, when the Cherokee Constitution comes into being, how did establishing a, a, a more formal nation, centralized nation, change people's ideas about care? Or did it? Why do we assume that it did? Um, and so this is the period where Cherokees are moving from towns governed by clan responsibilities to a more national social welfare system that would, after the Civil War, include an orphanage, a national prison, um, and a mental health facility that also served people with disabilities. So how do we go from matrilineal clans fulfilling all of those obligations across towns and within communities to nationally administered social services in buildings, institutions, big giant facilities. And I also wasn't willing to go into this project assuming that, oh, it's what, it's what white people were doing. Well, yeah, but why, did we, why should we assume that Cherokees are not doing it their own way? Cherokees have always kind of utilized these other tools that are out there in order to make adaptations within the community to better suit their needs. So, how, how, what are the adaptations that are happening? Why should we assume that these are just replications of what's happening in the larger United States at the time? So one of the ways that, you know, that I came to answer this question kind of early on relative to the orphanage itself, because that was the first institution I, I started studying, was Walter Adair Duncan. And some of you may have cross, come across him. He's sometimes listed as W.A. Duncan. He's sometimes listed as Watt Duncan. Um, he's listed in a variety of ways, um, but he's often not the main character in any of the, any of the, the documents or the, the readings that I uh, read through on a regular basis. And Walter Adair Duncan is an interesting um, case because he's born around 1823. We don't know the year he was um, officially born. Um, his father has a clan. His grandmother has a clan. But his father marries a um, white woman from South Carolina. So Walter Adair Duncan is the first generation within his family to not have a clan. And of course, if we think about that year, Removal pressures are amping up. The 1817 and 1819 treaties have just taken place, so there's already been some, some Western movement of Cherokee people of their own volition out here. There's also people in those treaties taking um, individual land reserves that in theory allowed them to become state citizens in Tennessee, in Georgia, um, in North Carolina. And and he's, so he's born at a moment when social welfare norms are also shifting within the Cherokee Nation. Well, Walter Adair Duncan, as I just mentioned these 1817-1919 treaties, his family takes one of these reserves in Georgia. And so, you know, I had to kind of play this question out with myself. Why? Why did his family take this reserve? Why? I mean, these are people who, um, who, who are definitely attending Christian churches, and they're definitely English speaking. Um, but on the other hand, there's a whole slew of daughters in this family, too. There's actually some older daughters. And this is a moment when, in the larger United States, and particularly in, in Georgia, Tennessee being two examples, um, women couldn't own property after they were married. Their husbands got control of that property. So if we're thinking about a, a matrilineal community where women had a lot of economic power and were able to keep control over their property, to, to become a citizen of these states really put your daughters 
in a very vulnerable economic position. Okay, so why? Why make this decision? Well, at that 1823, when Walter Adair Duncan's born, Walter Adair Duncan wasn't a Cherokee. He wasn't born a Cherokee. But in 1825, the council passes a law that says that men who marry non-Cherokee women, their children can become citizens of the nation. So when he's a roughly two years old, Walter Adair Duncan becomes a Cherokee Nation citizen. Okay. Well, for the vast majority of Cherokee people, they still have nat matrilineal clans. They still have a social welfare system, a rich, long social welfare system that's already in place. But what happens for these new citizens who don't have a social welfare system available to them through clans and kinship obligations? So the Duncan family moves back in to the nation after they lose their land in Georgia. They all move back into the nation. Um, Walter Adair Duncan's grandmother dies at some point before removal. And I could never get a clear date on when she passed away. Um, and the family ultimately moves uh, even before forced removal out here. So they become, they join with the older old settler community. And this is just an image of a page from the Tennessee agency records that actually lists the Duncan family taking those reserves and a description of where their property is at. And his grandmother is listed up here. And then he has some aunts and uncles listed right below there. And his father is listed here. So they took those reserves, but then they moved back into the nation. And of course, the, the, in some ways, this was kind of um, pre-allotment, like practicing of allotment by the federal government, that in theory, if you give these individual reserves of land to people, um, I, I like to compare it to, like, think of our community land base as a bucket filled with water. And you start poking holes in that bucket through these individual reserves, and suddenly our community land base is gone. So because his father, because his grandmother had a clan and had matrilineal kinship obligations available to them, they could move their family back into the nation. And by 1825, Walter Adair Duncan becomes a citizen. He doesn't have a clan, but he becomes a citizen. So now you have two kind of distinct groups within the nation. It's not that matrilineal kinship goes away. It's that you potentially have two different social welfare systems. Yeah, David, did you? Do you want to wait for questions at the end or ask? Yeah, could you, do you mind? No, not at okay. all. Okay, yeah. So hold it, I'm ready. <laughs> so I see this period as one that's also about thinking through how your family system looks, okay? And this is not a per, you know, there's, it, it, it's difficult to talk about this. You know, it's often these divides have been kind of labeled by academics or historians or people more broadly as saying, oh, it's a full blood, mixed blood divide, as if that's how Cherokee people conceptualize their families, right, on an everyday basis. Um, and so that language isn't helpful. And one way I've tried to think about this, and I don't know that it's perfect either, I don't know that it's any better, but thinking about your family's orientation. So is your family oriented toward that matrilineal system where women basically control the, the house and the property and still have political and economic as well as kind of social rights within that family that they're exercising on a regular basis? Are they still you know, economic agents in their own lives? Are they still in control of their children and rearing them up in particular kinds of ways? Are they still exercising their right to kind of put, put the husband's stuff out by the curb and say, done, move on? Um, or is it, is it that your family is more patrilineally oriented, where you have a male head of household, potentially someone who's engaged in um, the, the larger economic system happening both within and outside the nation? Are they merchants? Are they traders? Do they see their family as being um, 
led by the men, less egalitarian? Um, are they more concerned with, you know, are they profit seeking for their own family's benefits? At, you know, and again, these are not perfect um, ways of describing what happens. But in, ma in many ways, one of the things that I see, see happening with Duncan's family is that in this case, there is an acknowledgement that the, going and becoming a Georgia um, state citizen isn't necessarily a great choice, but at that moment, his son, John Duncan's sons have no real <coughs> political rights within the Cherokee Nation. But after 1825, they do, okay? And, and so not only that, then John Duncan's daughter's rights are protected too. So there's, there's a way in which all the children that John Duncan have become protected by both the nation and its matrilineal system that has a certain regard for women, as well as the citizenship that, that enables the sons to have certain abilities and rights. Now, you know, in some ways it's like, why does all of this matter? Well, because the nation is administering services to citizens, okay? And, and so they're conceptualizing citizenship at this point. So the idea is that in some ways, people that are receiving things from the nation um, you know, may or may not have clans at this point. They may have blood heritage and connections to families, and, but, but they may not have clans. And again, that system doesn't go away, it just operates simultaneously. So then what does that mean for somebody to become a citizen in this moment? And lots of that's been talked about voting. I mean, we do the political stuff. They vote, they participate in government, they get elected to council, they do all of these other things. But what does it mean for families? What does it mean for um, the daily protections of your own family, especially during this much more complicated removal period? So, and I'm going to skip that one. You know, some of the ways I've kind of thought about all of these things that are happening during the removal period is not through what's happening to the nation. I mean, that's been done. We know what's happening to the nation. We know the, the arguments that are being waged in the courts. We know all of these things are happening. Um, and I kind of rethought about the corn tassel case in particular. The corn tassel case was supposed to be the first test case was supposed to be the first case to test whether in fact the Cherokee Nation had sovereign control of its territory. And Corn Tassel had, had been accused of murdering another Cherokee within the boundaries of the Cherokee Nation. And Georgia said, no, we're gonna assert our rights to this case because these are people living within the boundaries of what Georgia claims. So there's an argument between the Cherokee Nation and Georgia over who has jurisdiction in this case. So, in, so Corn Tassel was um, found guilty of murder within Georgia. He was sentenced to a, a new Milledgeville prison. Um, the governor controlled the prison at that point. And the Corn Tassel case is moving toward the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court had issued a writ to actually hear the case. And Georgia, worried about the outcome of that case, expedites his execution. So once Corn Tassel's dead, there is no case. And that's always been talked about relative to um, politics or law. And I just kept thinking, what does that mean for Cherokee people? What does that mean that you know, you're, being, you're being told that you're gonna be a suit, uh, taken into this country, this larger United States, and granted you and his victim's family, but what does this mean that the Supreme Court is not going to be able to aid you in any way? Just on the ground families. And then you add to that the daily kind of traumas that Cherokee families are experiencing with theft of cattle, with beatings, with just kind of general intimidation. And I'm thinking Cherokee people who at this moment, particularly Klan members, you know, who don't necessarily need the nation because they've got a flourishing um, kinship system. Why the nation? Well, if your options are Georgia or your options are the Cherokee Nation, Cherokee Nation's looking really good. So all of these events, we have to rethink through the view of families and how people are experiencing these on the ground, not just 
what the politics of the law means. Ways John does during this period, family but no kin, traditional social wealth. At the same time, they're citizens, and they wind up becoming this old settler family uh, around 1834. They come this way. And then Walter Dare Duncan was 15, and thinking about the impact on a 15 year old young man as he's witness to <coughs> force removal. And I think, again, we often get caught up on um, in arguing about, well, what was going to happen with removal, but in fact, people on the ground are, are witnesses to this tragedy, particularly those old settlers who were already here. So what kind of impression does that make on him? And, you know, and then the question comes, what, you know, what social services develop after this period? So in the immediate post-removal period, um, there was no orphanage. Why not, th why not then? Why didn't they establish some of these services then? In the immediate post-removal period, there were lots of orphans. There were lots of kids um, who had lost family members. Everybody lost somebody during removal. So why not then? Well, they set up a system of foster care, so to speak. And one of the things that the Cherokee Nation's treaty, 1835 treaty, included was really exceptionally generous provisions for poor indigent Cherokees, for orphans, for anyone in need. In fact, our looked at the five tribes collective social service provisions in our treaty. I know that in this post-removal period, um, it's not that everybody's getting along. So you're not going to set up a jail during a moment when one group is feeling like they are being attacked by another group and they don't trust that the government's going to be fair and just in its administration of justice. So you're certainly not going to set up a prison because you could find yourself sitting in it over political arguments, not crime necessarily. So the prison is out of the question. It's proposed John Ross wants it in that post-removal period, but he's not going to get it. Okay. And that we think about removal, you're talking about an event that um, harmed everybody, but that was collectively felt. So everyone in that period after removal, you can read these counts, the post-removal of families kind of, you know, we read about the violence, but they're also there, families supporting each other as they rebuilt. And so it made perfect sense that you would take in a child who had come with your particular regiment and immediately take them in in ways that matter. And lots of families are moved together. So if you have matrilineal cl clan members, they're obligated. You're not even an orphan because if you have an aunt, you have a mother. So this whole concept of orphans for many Cherokee people is still a foreign concept in the practical and the everyday. So what the, what the nation did do was it set up a system that said, if a child is placed in a home, close proximity to school, they get access to education, and that family also got a financial payment to help support that child. And so at this point, they kind of continued the old period of guarding prisoners and or kind of expedient punishment. So lashes right away, you're out of here. Execution in the local communities, we're done. And it was very quick and quite expedient and yet at the same time is happening during this more politically volatile moment. People are not thinking disability in the same way that we think about them today. I guess that there were eccentric people didn't necessarily mean mental illness. You know, so people who were oddities in the condition of them, because that's a part of what you do. You adapt to difference in your community because you're, you're bound through um, community ob obligations to do that. You're bound to support your family member who might have a physical limitation because it's a reflection on your failure as a community member to care for them, not a reflection on them of having this particular disability somehow needing to be dealt with okay, or medicalized, but it's the community's responsibility. So there's no institutions during this period except the public schools, and, 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 but those are slightly in a different category. So one of the things that I was interested in is also how did Cherokee people respond to these institutions? So were, were we arguing with each other <laughs> over what happened at these institutions? Um, 
And in, in many ways, I see the institutions, what came cl became clear is that we felt better about some institutions than we felt about others. So <laughs> my last line says, kind of imagine a continuum of the like, loved institution and the reviled institution. Okay? The orphanage is lar largely an institution that people understood and embraced. So a lot of the, um, a lot of the pre-removal education had been administered through mission schools. Um, we had, we had uh, set up the seminaries in the post-removal period. Um, so there was a kind of a knowledge of institutions within the community. So institutions are not necessarily foreign or odd. And institutions that catered to kids were not necessarily foreign or odd. So no institutions in the pre-removal period, but what <laughs> ultimately kind of pushes us over, over to institutions is the Civil War. So we, I don't think we often kind of sit with the fact that we're talking one generation of people from removal to the Civil War. I mean, two major demographic disasters in one generation. I mean, how, you know, how you've just rebuilt, you're just, you're just finally getting established again, and then all of those old wounds from removal get opened back up again through the Civil War. And then add to that that people are scattered. People are in Kansas, people are in the Chickasaw Nation, people are in Texas, and they have to come back to the nation. And we have fought an all-out Civil War. So you also have to bring these people together and heal those divides. And in many ways, I mean, Lewis Downing is kind of a great hero during this period in that he's able to be a person who kind of brings people together from both sides of the aisle. And again, if we look at our Treaty of 1866, we often look at the politics, we often look at the money, we built in really generous social provisions, yet again. So we added money to our orphan services. We added funds in for um, an institution to serve um, people with disabilities, people with mental illness. I, it, conceptually, it was probably more like, meant to be more like a soldier's home, where you were treating soldiers who had potentially lost limbs or been blinded. Um, but it also did a whole host of other things. It, it cared, once it opened, cared for those who are deaf, those who are blind, okay? Um, and then we also got to a place where, you know, again, law and order has broken down in the greatest form. You have civil war, and how do you put people back together? And that one's a bit tough in that post-Civil War period even again. And so in that post-Civil War period, the immediate priority becomes the vintage kind of goes quickly. There had been a discussions of an orphanage during an early period. We already had an orphan care system in place. We've been talking about orphan care. People have been in the business of orphan care. And so the orphanage is kind of the most natural institution to come into place for Cherokee people. And the prison had been debated. It had been um, argued about. Um, and, it, and there had been a push to get a jail bill through in the immediate post-Civil War period. It failed. Then the Going Snake Massacre occurs. Okay. And you have this obvious moment of federal intrusion into the um, criminal justice world that's ours. Okay. And so there's a moment when you, know, you can't pass a jail bill. You have the Going Snake Massacre occur. And within just a few months' time, you get a jail bell through with a pretty generous budget compared to anything that had been able to even be proposed before. And so I don't think this is an embrace, necessarily, of a prison. I think it's also um, a recognition that the federal marshals are going to march themselves in here, whether we like it or not. And we can create a bureaucratic barrier. So a lot of our, a lot of the people that are going to be charged with crimes are potentially going to be charged with crimes within the nation, but they might have also committed some law that falls under federal jurisdiction. So a prison within our own community, you then can say to the federal government, 
you want to charge them for that crime, wait your turn. You want to try, you want to bring them over to Fort Smith, requisition them. Okay, so it's, I mean, we don't think of institutions as these barriers, but it becomes a sovereign barrier to outside intrusion. And it's also a way of saying, we're taking care of our business. What are you doing over there at Fort Smith? Step it up. Yeah. We'll take care of ours. You take care of yours. Okay. And so the prison is one of those that people kind of see as a necessary evil in that post-Civil War period. And of course, what are the accusations being thrown at Indian Territory in the post-Civil War period? It's lawless. It's cr harboring criminals. Okay. It's wild Indians. So if you can say, look, we've got a prison. We've got a police force. We've got a, a, a pretty intricate court system. Then in fact, those accusations break down. Okay, and then the asylum is, is to some extent perhaps the, the trickiest institution, the, the, um, the full name of the asylum that's most often referred to, although it went through variations, was the Asylum for the Deaf, Dumb, Blind, and Insane. Okay. Obviously, we don't use those terms anymore um, to talk about um, people with disabilities in the same way. But that institution hadn't been talked about, hadn't been debated, hadn't been discussed, and it was this catch-all institution. And so if we're thinking about that continuum, it was the one that Cherokee people were the most uncomfortable with overall. So these institutions, and I've included some of the pictures that, that, you, that are in the book. This is Walter Adair Duncan with some of the teaching staff. And just, you know, we can make some observations about some of what these institutions are doing there's job creation. And we can look at this picture and go, huh, who is getting jobs as a result of these institutions? Well, there's Walter Adair Duncan, but there are jobs being created for women. And so you're the, there are in, these institutions, regardless of which one they are, are creating jobs for Cherokee people. In a period when economic recovery needs to happen after the war, People need to know that they have a place to contribute. And the other thing that the orphanage does, and this is from 1886-87. This is, from 87. This is our, the kindergarten class. And I love this image because you know, we get caught up on thinking about what Cherokee people look like, right? You know, I mean, this is the conversation that lots of people outside the community assume, like the high cheekbones, that makes me this or that. And, and then, of course, you look at a picture like this and go, look at what our people look like in 1886 and 1887. I mean, look at what our children look like in 1886 and 1887. And in this picture, there are more than likely some monolingual Cherokee speakers. There are more than likely some bilingual English and Cherokee speakers. There are more than likely some monolingual English speakers. And so at this institution, in this post-Civil War period, you have an opportunity to bring kids together who lingually may be in very different places, whose families politically might have been in very different places. But the next generation gets to forge gener relationships with one another through these institutions. So if we're thinking about reconciliation and unification, our children are doing some of that work at the asylum. And they did. They formed relationships. They got married. They, you know, they stayed friends for a long time. You know, it could have been the first time for some of these English speakers that they're around Cherokee speakers all the time. It could have been the first time some of these monolingual Cherokee speakers were around English speakers all the time. And in contrast to the boarding schools, which will open later than our orphanage, Cherokee language was the, was the language of the home, and this was a home. Nobody, nobody, the language never, there's no sign that it ever got rooted out. But English was the language of the school. But there's also instances of kids using the Cherokee language at the school. So it's a contrast to that boarding school experience that many of our children were, um, were potentially exposed to if we didn't have an orphanage within the nation either. 
Now, the national prison, eh, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty manly space. There are very few instances of women showing up in the prison. Um, and at the same time, it's also a space where there's lots of lingual diversity. So I had my students this past semester, because I'll come back to this, but the final prisoners, there were 18 final prisoners that had to be, um, they had to figure out what to do with them at the time of allotment. And I had my students go back and do some research on them. And come to find out, we have a Creek Cherokee speaker. We have a Creek or a Cherokee Shawnee speaker. We had some monolingual, monolingual English speakers in the prison. We had some monolingual Cherokee speakers in the prison. That it's a really lingually diverse place too. And that the guards in those prisons are, are go-betweens between all of these communities. So very often guards were, were, some of them were monolingual in Cherokee, but many of them were bilingual. So they were acting as intermediaries in, in many ways between um, the languages even of the prison. And this picture I love, I only just found out this past Saturday. I didn't realize this when I wrote the book and I was like, man, I wish I had known that when I wrote the book. <laughs> So this is pretty late. This is right around the time of, of, of closure of the prison. And I, kept, I saw, so you can see the child here. And there's a child over here and another child. That, that you have children in the picture. So one of the conclusions that I came to, too, is that Cherokee people um, understood at that time the, the fine line they walk between criminal and law-abiding. Sam Sixkiller, first high sheriff of the Cherokee Nation, is ultimately um, brought up on murder charges, loses his job. Um, eventually, he's cleared of all those charges. But our lawmen walked a fine line between prisoner and law upholder. Okay. And so if our own lawmen kind of walk that fine line, imagine the, the fine line everyday people without a national title walked relative to crime. So there was a recognition by Cherokee people that were obligated to people even when they've done something, they've fallen off the, the straight and narrow, they've veered off course, they're gonna come back to our community and we're obligated to them. And so you get accounts in the, w, or the WPA Indian Pioneer Papers of people housing prisoners in their home, but also opening up their home to people running from the law. Because community ethics says you're obligated to all of them. Didn't harm you. So sure, come on in, have a meal. I know you're wanted. Sure, come on in, have a meal. You're, you're taking these prison, prisoners over to Fort Smith. That those community obligations rose above it, but ultimately these people were coming back to our community we were obligated to them. And so there's a comfort by John Duncan, not Walter Adair Duncan's father, Walter Adair Duncan's son, who's the last high sheriff of the Cherokee Nation, feels perfectly comfortable with his children in this picture. Doesn't feel like he needs to protect his children from these prisoners because they're also members of the community, just like his children. So, there's another picture of the prison when it had its additional floor. That fence was a constant source of economic, that fence had to be repaired every year, okay? Um, and then this is a picture of the asylum. It never held the number of people that it could have, ever. Now, in 1903, the orphanage burned to the ground. That's a period during, a, moving up to allotment. And so what they did was they retrofitted this institution and moved all of our orphans into that building at the time of allotment. And that's, of course, our Park Hill site where Sequoia Schools is today. So one thing I always like to remind everyone I talk to is that our orphanage has operated in perpetuity since 1872. Now, we didn't control it during that whole period but it's operated in perpetuity since 1872, okay? Which is you know, a point I like to make too because these institutions in terms of what they also did is at the time of allotment they became negotiation tools. We have all this care for our citizens 
there's a hearing before Oklahoma, you know you're going to have to give up your institutions. You're going to have to give up your, um, your blind institute. You're going to have to give up your seminaries. And the, an Oklahoma official says, well, we don't have any of those things. And you can only imagine that Cherokee folks were sitting there going, huh, we have to give those up. Okay. So there's a massive redistribution of our institutions to o the state of Oklahoma at the time of allotment, but they were also negotiating tools. We have care. They negotiated care for all of the patients still at the asylum. But Oklahoma had to continue to take care of those individuals and provide care for them. Um, and so th one thing I will say about the asylum is that in the early years, it was mostly blind patients. Over time, that changed. Over time, there were more criminally insane or people who were loosely being de designated um, criminally insane. Um, pe family members pulled their, their family members out because of certain concerns about the facility. And some of that is tied to the medicalization that's happening. But some of it, I think, is tied to tensions over allotment, too. That at the same time, the medical profession is um, is professionalizing and centralizing and doing all of these things that are that are saying we need to separate um, spirit and religion and cosmology and this is true in the larger United States too that that medical care needs to be about science okay and for Cherokee people that becomes a little uneasy and it's happening at the same moment that there are tensions over the loss of the communal land base so the anxieties are even higher during this period and so the, the turning over a lot of authority and control to medical superintendents, this particularly happened at the asylum. And the medical and superintendent, sometimes they were not Cherokees, but some of them were, um, increasingly wanted a more tightly controlled institution. So in its early years, the steward had more control. Over time, the medical superintendent offers far more kind of authority and power and they start enforcing um, visiting hours. And they put out uh, comments in the paper that we don't want people just visiting and lounging around the asylum. Well, if your family member's in one of these institutions, or they're your community member, you're going to go visit them. So they put the patients more on lockdown. So one of the great stories that I, I love that I came across very early in my research is that in the very earliest years, there was a, 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 a close association formed between Sasa and Creek Killer. And I'm going to get the reverse. One of them is blind. One of them is deaf. But they form a cooperative association to go visit the seminarians. And so they traverse and they head over to the seminaries and visit. And then the seminary students are coming to the asylum to visit. And there's a lot of back and forth between the institutions. There's accounts of, of asylum residents showing up at the National Council, wreaking a little bit of havoc, but showing up at the National Council, voicing their concerns. And that starts to tighten. And families don't respond well to that. This is a community institution. And you tighten control over it, and you tell us we can't have access to our family members, then we're not, we're not going to support that institution. And so people began to kind of not send their family members there over time. Part of what happens, too, is that once the Fort Gibson School for the Blind opens, there's another option for those blind family members that had been at that institution earlier. So the other piece of this is that the asylum has a medical superintendent, so there are people who are seeing this institution as a hospital. And so you start to see more chronically ill patients at the asylum. So it's, it's, and this is a moment when, you know, again, people are anxious about their care, anxious about the, the health and well-being of their family members, at the same time that they're being told they're about to lose their land base. So those are all of our institutions. And I want to you know, say some final things just about the institutions more broadly. That, now, in one way, they, they brought together really different Cherokee people who forged new kinds of relationships. And um, you know, th this may be me stepping on a slight soapbox relative to our larger world we're in right now, where we have a lot of trouble talking to people 
who perhaps take positions that are not our own. Um, and that these institutions created spaces where Cherokee people who may not have shared every interest still lived together and spoke together. You know, and I would say that, you know, I mean, again, I don't think this is a Cherokee exclusive um, question right now, that, that all of us need to figure out ways to communicate and talk. And, and that this, these acted as um, conciliatory spaces in the post-Civil War period. And yet they also set the nation up at the time of allotment to say, these are the expectations of social welfare that we have for the state of Oklahoma. And, and that many of these people carried these obligations forward. And that um, I think is really powerful in terms of some of the stories you see at the time of allotment where many of these bilingual Cherokees at the orphanage are doing a lot of interpretation work at the time of allotment for family members. They're able to do this because their language wasn't quashed in our institutions. It's, it flourished and it survived. So, David, I know you have a question. So I'm gonna stop there in order to give time for questions and I'm happy to field any and all, so. Real quick before we start, um, just for our viewers that are watching online, when I ask a question, if you could just repeat it. Okay. My question was, in the, in the beginning of your, your discussion today, uh, you spoke about Cherokees who had no citizenship, mm -hmm. or what I would classify today as descendants, mm -hmm. uh, not having the status of citizenship, the political status. And then in 1825, a law was passed that uh, granted citizenship to the children of non-Cherokee women. Mm -hmm. In that pre-1825 period, citizenship was handed from mother to child, intact, 100%, you're totally Cherokee, mm -hmm. regardless of blood quantum. Mm -hmm. <coughs> that, that law, in the way that it's worded, infers that citizenship is being passed from father to child equally to what women do. Mm -hmm. And so what we know that women did prior to 1825 was bestow clan and thus simultaneously citizenship. Thereby, did men acquire the ability to pass clan to their children? That, I, I would say that I think in a later period, oh, so let me repeat the question. So the question became in 1825 when, when the law was passed that Cherokee men could grant citizenship to the children, that they conferred citizenship on their children. Um, did that law potentially imply that, that men could also pass clans onto their children? Um, I see people in a later period kind of using that language more loosely, right? That there, there, there is a conception in a, in a later period, um, particularly Civil War era beyond, where there does seem to be some conflation of those things, okay? But what, what we know, too, is that most of the documents that we're seeing, I mean, most of the documents I work in, um, and, and, and this is something, you know, I feel like um, we still have so much work to do. I just was at McFarlane at, in the Special Collections this past week and was blown away at the number of Cherokee language documents that are sitting in Special Collections there. Um, and you know, as Roy can attest, there's documents everywhere that are written in Cherokee, most of which have not been used or have not been readily accessible to people writing about Cherokee history. So I, I'm not convinced that everyday Cherokee people who were, who were monolingual and matrilineally oriented bought that fathers could confer clan. Do I think that people who perhaps misunderstand older understandings of clan and matrilineal kinship thought that they could confer clans on their children? Probably. If, if clan and citizenship were synonymous. I don't see them as synonymous. You don't see them as synonymous mm -hmm. with each other? No. So, so someone could have a clan but not citizenship? Conceivably, yeah. Today they could. Yeah. At that time, Prior to 1825, I don't see how that's possible. 
Well, prior to 1825, they would have only had clans. Right, and clan was synonymous with citizenship. Different kinds of, you know, I mean, so we're talking about two different political systems, they too. Exclusive. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that both, you know, I mean, we have to think about the fact that, you know, certainly, I think there were lots of Cherokee people at the time that that law was passed who had clans who, who were obligated to matrilineal clans, who understood those obligations, recognized the, the, um, the tool of the nation, right, against removal, against the threats of the United States. And they're willing to go along with that, okay? They're willing to participate in both of those systems. It doesn't necessarily undo matrilineal um, kinship and clan obligations, okay? Um, but it does add another layer of protection for people that are both matrilineal clan members and people who are citizens, that there are certain protections that both of those afford. Um, and I think over time that shifts a little bit in that there are, there are more and more people with notions of citizenship with less understanding of matrilineal kinship obligations. And so one thing I would say about Walter Adair Duncan that kind of complicates this in many ways, is that Walter Adair Duncan, as I said, wasn't born a Cherokee, he didn't have a clan. He becomes a citizen, okay? At the time of allotment, he is one of the fiercest <coughs> opponents of allotment, and most of his arguments are about social welfare. He's, he's, he's telling the U.S. that it's based on greed, that there are homeless people throughout the United States, and how dare the United States invite people into that system where, and what, kind of a, a paraphrasing of that quote is, where most people don't have a plot of land to be buried on. And that's not true in the Cherokee Nation with a communal land base. And so he's attacking the social welfare system that, that Cherokee people are kind of forcibly being pushed into. And he's doing that partly because of the friends of the Indians um, who are arguing that we're, we need help with our social welfare system. But Walter Adair Duncan, there's a great story I kind of end with relative to him. When he walks in the allotment office, all these younger men tell him to take his hat off. And he, he says, you come tell me to, you come make me take my hat off. He has no respect for this process. He challenges a boundary line. He knows there's a boundary line that, that's wrong, that they've done a boundary long, line wrong. So he attempts to take his allotment on that boundary line to force the question. Okay, that this is somebody who is going to, who uses these administrative bureaucratic systems to fight other kinds of bureaucratic administrative systems. And so I would say at the end of Walter Adair Duncan's life, he may not, um, he may not have, have been born with a clan, but he understood what it meant to be Cherokee, and he understood the power of a communal land base, and he understood the power. He was educated in the nation, not in the schools. He was educated in the nation by Cherokee people, by people who understood community ethics, by people who understood that older social welfare system. And so he was able to, to defend and talk about both systems, even though when he was born, he wasn't a member of that other system. He was a citizen, but he got an education throughout his life. And I think that, the, that, that many people did. And so the question becomes, what happens when you lose that, that community education that is not happening in schools? It's happening by being a member of a community, by understanding the values of that community. And I don't have all, Walter Darrow Duncan is one example. I don't, I don't pretend to say that he is representative of everybody, but I think he's one example. Yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, so, the, you know, so the other, you know, I do talk about this a little bit in the book, is the other moment when we expand our citizenry is in that post-Civil War period. Now, our citizenry stretches to former Cherokee freedmen, okay? And so one of the ways that I perhaps, um, you know, maybe, I mean, I, Walter Dare Duncan is my historic boyfriend, but occasionally we have arguments, okay? And, and one of the arguments that I have with him is that, in this post-Civil War period, and there's no smoking gun to indict him, 
but he's the, he's the superintendent of the orphanage, and freedmen are desperately trying to get access to the orphanage for their children, okay? And freedmen are all over the political spectrum more broadly in this period, but one of the things that kind of collectively came together on is we need a facility for our children too. And there were, there were pragmatic arguments made that there wasn't enough space, and that was true, orphanage was always filled, that you know, then they squared off over whose responsibility it was to set up the budget. But Walter Adair Duncan was the, was the leader of that institution, was the superintendent, and he benefited from this other moment when we expanded Cherokee citizenship. He benefited. His family benefited. Over time, there were lots of accrual of social welfare benefits. But after the Civil War, I never see him advocate for those benefits for the freedmen. So there's a moment in which there, there wasn't the ability, even though he had benefited from an expanded citizenry, he wasn't able to kind of stretch that to the freedmen in the post-Civil War period. And again, I don't, there's, it's not that I, you know, maybe he has writings on this and I haven't come across them. But we do have to think about like, who gets to benefit from the, the, the gifts of citizenship and who gets locked out in certain ways from those gifts of citizenship. And you know, I, I think we have to wrestle with that. Because there's a lot of people who benefited from citizenship, but who did not see that they should extend those benefits to others in that post-Civil War period. Yes? You talked about the liberal terms of the removal treaty. Uh-huh. Are we talking about the treaty of the children? We are. So the illegal, even a moral treaty, that had liberal terms in it for removal. I don't contest that. So the question was, is this the illegal, immoral um, treaty that was signed at the time of removal? I, have n I do not contest that this was, um, this treaty was signed by a not representative group, you know, that they didn't have the, the, the legal right to sign that treaty that would have been put for the, forward for the rest of us. However, okay, however, leading up to that treaty, there are lots of people kind of, there, there are drafts of the treaty being written. John Ross has been a party to some of these drafts, okay? Now, this is also, I mean, John Ross at one point says to the federal government, give us 20 million, 20 million, okay? Which I think is a strategy. He knows he's never gonna get 20 million, okay? But he's slowing down the process because if you out threw out 20 million, they've gotta come back with another offer, okay? However, they're, they're also giving the impression that like, we're, we're talking about this process, we're thinking through it, we're figuring it out. They're biding their time. The other, the other nations are writing treaties. They're looking at those treaties. And so the, even an earlier version of Achoda that, that Ridge and Boudinot wouldn't sign on to it because they said it didn't have enough social welfare provisions. So we have to think that this is a period, I mean, we think about the Neuotrota Treaty as being this one thing, but in fact, we're talking about a longer period of time where there's lots of strategies playing out. And so relative to the other tribes, we had the most favorable social provisions. So yes, can, illegal. However, you know, adding some caveats about that, Other questions? Yes? So that's, um, you know, so they arrive in, in 98 to force the negotiation, I mean, to kind of unilaterally say this is going to go move forward. That's when the commissioners arrive. Um, you know, in many ways, one of the kind of savvy things, and this relates to social welfare, is that, again, we always focus on the political, but we all know that this was about land. <laughs> like, let's not kid ourselves. Allotment was about land, okay? And so who's pushing allotment, at least in its earliest years? It's railroads, it's speculators, 
Okay, but then who's, who becomes the strange bedfellow to those folks? The Friends of the Indians, the Northeastern Eastern social reformers. Okay, then they add a moral argument to this, right? That, oh, those poor Indians, they don't have education. They don't have law. They're backwards. They, they need access to all of these things that we can provide them. They need to learn English. They, you know, so so the, the Cherokee Nation, in, in a sense, and this is you know, to some extent why they're able to push back against the 1887 mm -hmm. Dawes Act and be excluded from it, is because everybody kind of looks at the five tribes and go, well, wait a minute, you said they were civilized. That, that there's an argument that can be made that they, they've done all these things that they're, we're accusing them of not having done. And so these reformers step in to kind of make this certain kind of moral argument to move allotment forward. And there's a period, like Pr Pratt is a prime example, opens Carlisle. He, he took all the uh, prisoners from Fort Sill down to St. Augustine. And one of these reformers is writing in an educational journal like, oh, the, these prisoners just need the education that, that the Cherokees that the, these benefits that the Cherokees got. And my response to that was, Cherokees negotiated those benefits in treaties. And they're not saying, hey, let's let the Apaches negotiate through treaties, because treaties were done. So the Apaches aren't in a position to negotiate social welfare provisions in the same way that Cherokees were. Cherokees know that. And they're saying, wait a minute, you know, we designed these systems. You're not giving other tribes the, the opportunity to design their systems, okay? And so, um, so the Dawes winds up also divvying up land along. Um, I mean, think about how a lot of the land exploitation happens. Orphans. So you have people stepping in to be guardians to 10, 12 orphans. That's not about caring for those orphans. It's about controlling their land, controlling the leases on their property. So social welfare does get wrapped up in the Dawes. Um, but one thing that I would say too is that there's this great moment, I think, at the time of allotment relative to people who have been at institutions. So you have, um, there's two prisoners that go into the Dawes Commission together to sign up former prisoners. And they vouch for each other. I don't know if they were friends before they went to prison. I don't know if they got to be buddies in prison. But I know that they were kind of, they were there for each other at a moment that they could have been vulnerable in a particular way. And they said, I got your back. Okay, Emmett Starr comes in and keeps the role, like goes through all of the institutional roles. So having had those institutional roles, having had an orphanage, having had a prison, they made sure that all those prisoners' names get included on allotment so that all of those people who'd been in institutions have a protection in place and make sure that they get land. So our institutions in some ways served as a second kind of fail-safe to making sure that the people who should be on those roles were on them. And so all of this gets wrapped up with allotment. And of course, you know, I'm not sure the longer term effects of this. I mean, some of the people fare pretty well in the post statehood period, but there's also a way in which, um, what does it mean that suddenly Cherokee Nation is not inside in, in charge of uh, assigning teachers to schools, is no longer in charge of giving contracts for pork or selling, you know, people selling eggs that there's an economic loss potentially in play if now you're beholden to um, non-Indians who don't necessarily have great attitudes about Indian people. So there's a greater kind of added economic loss that we can't just think about relative to land. That's one loss. But you no longer have the same access to professional opportunities, to economic opportunities that you had before either. So, I mean, I think that's something that we haven't necessarily thought about relative to allotment, but I think is incredibly important. So it, it's all wrapped up. And again, social service providers of the nation are making social welfare arguments. 
They're talking about the damage that this will do to Cherokee families. Walter Adair Duncan's brother is bi actually trilingual. Um, he, write, he actually does a lot of interpretive work for those, um, of course, being labeled full bloods. And he's talking, uh, he's interpreting, and he says, you know, there's blood that he quotes, and he says, I'm going to get dragged into Fort Smith, and I won't know if it's because I went for the law or against it. I might as well live in England. And so there's a real concern on the part of Cherokee men, especially. There's real anxiety over um, the ways that the, the courts may abuse Native people's rights in that post-statehood period. And so again, another social welfare concern, which we often think about relative to politics and law, but that is also about people's livelihoods, their, 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 their existence in the everyday, the kind of comfort that you get to live with, and that people are fearful. And Arkansas did not have a good track record relative to its prisoners at that period either, I should add. Other questions? I know you had, you had a question. Did you? I was curious about the plan system. You may have that uh, as far as the kinship responsibilities and obligations on the matrilineal side and then the social welfare thing in the government, mm -hmm. um, does that mean the government replaced kinship obligations for certain types of social responsibilities? Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, then uh, it would seem that that occurred much earlier because the clan system uh, In theory. In theory, yeah. <laughs> so, so the question, if, as I understand it, is if um, the federal government or if the uh, Cherokee National Government is providing social welfare services, is that in fact replacing clan obligations and matrilineal obligations to one another? And I would say um, no. Um, that for Again, for clan members, you're kind of gaining access to both systems. Um, so it's actually kind of adding a layer of protection. Um, but on the other hand, those systems still operated. They still operate in, in the form of um, you know, just a, a generosity. I would say that's one of the ways that I see it still being, um, you know, that this is something that if we think about the, the Friends of the Indians um, arguments about uh, greed, right? That there's no, th this was actually something that was commonly said at the time of allotment. Indians don't know greed. We need to teach them greed. They need to be profit seeking. Okay? So it was seen as a flaw to be generous because generosity kept you impoverished somehow. Okay? That was, that was the, the argument that was being made. And so um, I would say that 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 obligation and those obligations got infused into institutions. I'll give you a prime example. There was a, a guard by the name of Charlie Poor Bear, and Charlie Poor Bear um, was certainly um, a first language Cherokee speaker. He signed all his documents in Cherokee and the records that I found. Um, but there was one month when there was no money, prisoners received $5 in a suit of clothes when they were released from prison to get themselves back on on their feet. And there was no money at the prison to make these payments. And Charlie Poor Bear makes the payments to three prisoners, pays $15 out. Now, he may have known he was going to be reimbursed, but he didn't have to do that. He didn't have to give them his money. And that was over a month of his own salary. because he wanted those men to step out into the world with the, the money that they needed. I mean, that, that's a community obligation. That's being driven by something else. I mean, that's one example. I think there are many of those kinds of examples where that community obligation, that sense of obligation, um, is demonstrated by people in institutions um, who, who operate under 
you know, in both, you know, they're citizens and they're clan members. They're, you know, they're guided by a, you know, a spirit of, of giving and responsibility. And so um, those don't necessarily go away. What you have at these institutions is a hybrid. You have the best, kind of some of the best virtues of a matrilineal kinship system infusing themselves into the institutions themselves. Other questions? And then we've gone. Catherine may cut me off. <laughs> just my stick pull away. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for <laughs> Email. I send out a 